Um, my name is Jeremy Lord, and welcome to another Adobe Live Pack episode. Um, this is episode two in our four-part series on basically everything digital drawing. So I'm an illustrator. Um, I use Photoshop pretty much all the time um, in everything that I do. And I thought I'd just do a kind of like a four-part series in um, kind of showing you guys how to um, take a, you know, something from out of your head and get it into a finished product. So last week, we went through kind of basic sketching. We looked at brushes. We looked at kind of using reference versus inspiration, how that all works. We'll, we'll cover a little bit about um, those today as well. Um, and we ended up basically with this kind of loose sketch based on very basic building blocks from this photo of um, Demon Slayer's Tomioka. Um, just a figurine that I, I saw in a in a shop um recently took a photo i thought it was a cool pose um and started kind of messing around with that uh, and we looked at kind of basic building blocks and shapes and did some very loose kind of outlines on top of it um but in the meantime i have as you can see kind of gone in and <clears throat> obviously done a little bit more work to this um nothing here that I've done on this has not been kind of covered last week in, in last week's episode. Um, it's just more time. So we do this thing where it's just kind of like, cool, you know, like you've got like, it's like a cooking show where it's like, oh, we need to chop up like 50 oranges. I'm just going to show you how to do one and then we'll cut to the chase. And there's like, cool, now 50 oranges have been cut just because it's like, there's nothing new here. We're just kind of spending more time doing it. Um, so as you can see, there's there's been a little bit of kind of edits on the pose. Um, I've still done the same kind of principle here in terms of, you know, doing basic building blocks. Um, last week, we talked about how to do hands a little bit more easily, feet, legs, cylinders, how to get the kind of the, the main action of the pose down. And then based on that, I've gone in and kind of done um, a lot more detail, trying to get this kind of inspirational reference of this pose, but inspiration from these kind of like cyberpunk dragon ball z goku kind of um ideas um and so working loosely from that right it's like it's not goku he doesn't have the right haircut but he's definitely got a little kind of tail he's got the bow staff um so there is some kind of reference elements in there it's cyberpunk um it's inspired by all of that so there's a bit of a mix of, of both of these to kind of get to um where we're at at this stage um so with this, there's probably still a few things that would need to be more kind of resolved before getting into inking. So inking would be the next phase. We've done our sketch. Um, it's looking pretty good. I like the pose. Everything works. Um, a quick thing for you, if you're kind of looking at trying to figure out, you know, is this um, working? Is this old trick of flipping the canvas? So flipping from left to right or even upside down, generally left to right and just kind of looking at it from a different angle um, gives you kind of a fresh look on something and makes kind of mistakes pop out at you a little bit better. Um, and so a lot of artists will do this where they'll just kind of like flip back and forth in between kind of these things to see like, is there anything really jumping out at me here that that I need to fix before I start inking this. Um, and at this stage, I'm pretty happy. As I said, um, this hand over here probably needs a little bit more work, um, but you know, you can spend a lot of time doing the sketch and at the end of the day, you kind of need to move on to the inking. So we're gonna do that today. Uh, and we're gonna start inking this character up. And if we need to, we can go back to do some sketching. We can kind of finish off. There's a lot of kind of back and forth here. This isn't just like, we're never sketching again, we're doing inking now. Um, that's not really how that works. So at this stage, I have worked at a relatively lowish resolution. We'll put this in millimeters. Um, and you can see this is basically in A4 because that's the file that I created. So. This is a personal brief, as in like, this is something that I've given myself to do. This is not coming from a client. Um, and that means basically like, I, I can do anything that I want with this. I can turn it into a post, I can make stickers, I can put it on a t-shirt. Um, there's a range of different things that we can do, but now is the time that I need to think about what I'm likely gonna be doing with this. Again, being a personal brief, I make that decision 
Um, if this was a live brief with the client, the client would obviously give me the specs of the file that they want. We need it on A3 posters. We need it for desk mats. We need it for whatever. And I would have to work to that resolution. Um, one of the big things that I would advise at this stage when you're looking at image size, uh, and by the way, how I brought that up is um, command or control, alt and I pops up this menu. Or if you're not into the shortcut life, you can go and find that up here in image size and it brings up the same menu. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to work. Usually I'd like to work a little bit bigger than I think I might potentially do um, because I'm working in Photoshop. I'm working with pixels, um, i.e. bitmap. So as opposed to vector. So vector is an illustrator and you can work at whatever size you want and it will be infinitely scalable. Photoshop, not so, unfortunately. Um, because you've got a lot more control over the pixels individually, which is why I like to work in it, you need to plan ahead. Uh, and so for this, I'm going to go much bigger than I think I'm going to go, um, that I'm probably going to need. And we're going to potentially work to a desk mat. Um, so let's go really quite big. I'm going to go in with like an A2 size here, and that's going to pretty much cover us for a um, desk mat. So we're going to go in with a width of uh, we're gonna go 594 and uh, um, 594 by 420. And that's going to be our um, A4. I think I might be getting my dimensions wrong. I usually do this pretty quickly, but um, is that correct? I think so. Anyways, um, the reason being doing this now is like, obviously you can see that as I'm kind of zooming in on this, it's done some like bad pixelation because I, I wasn't working at that resolution to begin with. Um, but now that I'm going to be doing final line work, I need to have that down. Um, so we're going to start with, um, I'm going to call this one sketch and that's just going to live there. And that's going to be my reference kind of layer. Um, I've done another one as well with a slightly kind of different hand pose, a little bit more kind of Goku inspired. He's got like the, the bead necklace, he's got the belt, um, and the kind of the uniform that Goku would have. Um, I don't mind this hand, um, but I think this one's probably just a little bit more kind of what I'm looking for on this one. So I'm going to drop the opacity down to kind of like roughly about here. And I'm going to create a new layer. Whoops, not a layer group, a new layer. And I'm going to call this one OTL. So this is my shorthand for like outlines, basically. Uh, and now is when I can start to work to my inking. So. Inking brush, um, depending on what style you're going for, um, I like a, a little bit of a cleaner style, a um, little bit more kind of like manga based style. So I usually work with either Kyle's Manga Smoothie. Um, so <laughs> it sounds like an appetizing drink, um, but it is something that you can get for free if you've got an Adobe account. Um, you can go into your Get More Brushes uh, which I think lives somewhere around here. Yep, there we go. Get more brushes and it will pop you up onto the Adobe website where you can see a whole bunch of different brush packs done by Carl T. Webster. Um, and the one I use uh, generally this kind of like manga brush pack and you just hit download and it will install and add into your brush. So I use either this one, uh, which looks like this. You can see the curse is a little bit oval um, and it has a little bit of a taper in it, or this one, which is basically the same thing, um, just without the kind of the oval line to it. Um, if you're into kind of brush settings, you can see the basic things that I'm looking for are um, shape dynamics with my size jitter. And I want that set to pen pressure. Um, what that means is basically if I'm using my Wacom instead of a mouse, um, we kind of covered that last week, but the lighter I press, the thinner the line, and the thicker, the heavier I press, the thicker the line. So that's going to allow me to get that kind of nice um, tapered edge that I would want in my kind of drawings here and get a nice kind of thin to thick ratio for this kind of inking. 
Um, the old school way of doing this is to kind of do this and then do what's called a cutback. So using the eraser, you would then come in and kind of sharpen that line off a little bit, um, which you know gives you a really super clean result, but it's a lot of extra work because every stroke you do, you got to do two or three more strokes to kind of sharpen that line down. So it is, it does add a fair bit of extra work um, to this. So uh, again, up to you how you work. This is generally how I will kind of do. It. I'll just use this Round Inco or Carl's Manga Smoothie, um, and I'll turn the smoothing up up here. We have got a smoothing slider. What that does is it kind of allows your line to go from this like slightly stressed out and I had too many coffees to, you know, if we boost this up to like 50 or 60, you'll see that's going to be a lot harder for me to get that wobble. Like I have to really pronounce that a lot more. It's going to smooth that line for me a little bit, make it a little bit kind of cleaner and, and nicer for me. So generally I like to have that around sort of the 25 to 30 mark. Um, keep it around 27 for a nice middle ground. Um, and then it's time to just get into the, the inking phase. So again, uh, if I was a good boy, I'd probably go in and like finish off these hands in here. But there is some stuff that you can do, like figure out and resolve at the inking stage. But generally speaking, I find the more you leave out and the quicker you go into the inking phase, uh, the harder you're making life for yourself because you're no longer like you're still kind of figuring out the drawing when you're inking it can be a little bit tricky to to work in that way but for the sake of the stream um we're going to jump straight in and start working like this so again um this is a pretty kind of straightforward process for me um zooming in and then just getting straight into work so here we go So this can be, again, like a pretty nice exercise in kind of like relaxation and meditation because you really want to kind of get your breathing going, um, get a little bit of kind of like weight and not weight, get the pressure going on your hands so you get the stroke that you're looking for. Um, it's something that I really enjoy doing a lot is the inking stage, um, which is probably why I generally tend, tend to like skip the, you know, jump the gun a little bit and want to get into this ASAP um, rather than still trying to figuring out the, the drawing and kind of where it all, how it all works. Um, it's just really quite tempting for me to get here as fast as possible, which sometimes kind of plays tricks on me, um, but yeah. Um, Again, don't hesitate if you guys have any questions in chat as well. Um, while I'm doing this, I'll tend to kind of just zone out. As I said, this is kind of quite like meditative for me. Um, so if you guys have any questions, pop them in chat and I'll, um, I'll get to them in good time. Something else that you can think about when you're doing inking here is next week, we'll talk a little bit about shading. Um, but one of the tricks that a lot of artists will do when they're doing the inking is they'll treat it, the inking and kind of line thickness in accordance with kind of where the light might be coming from. So for instance, let's say I've got a light source coming from here and I've got a sphere, right? I've just got a circle that's going to be a sphere later on. So I'll put some shading in here later on. Um, but what a lot of artists will do is they'll do the side that's catching the light in a thinner line stroke and then underneath that where there's shadow they'll go a little bit thicker it just accentuates that kind of shading a little bit more um, and just gives you a little bit more kind of room there so that can be something that you think about doing um, i generally don't worry too much about that kind of stuff but again um, it is something that's available to you if you are so inclined This is also where a lot of times you will get a little bit of frustration because of that age old thing of like, like my sketch is so much better than my finished piece. That is a reality, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and the reason why I think that happens 
is because your sketch doesn't need to be um, finalized. There's a lot of stuff that's just kind of like, hey, this is a hint of something. It's just an impression of a thing. It doesn't need to be locked in. Uh, and so when you do your inking, you do have to lock all that stuff in and it, it can create this sense of like, this was better before and it's because you're leaving stuff to the imagination in the sketch and not so much anymore in the actual line drawing this band-aid on his nose would be terrible um am i familiar with t-lines uh no i am not familiar with t-lines i have never heard of that i don't know if that makes me the most unlegit digital artist ever i hope not So again, we're going for that like manga anime vibe, um, slight kind of Goku kind of look like monkey boy kind of look, um, can work with some referencing in here, get those kind of sweat beads happening. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we can kind of, you know, stick in here to, to get the kind of the mood of the piece a little bit better. get a little bit rid of that kind of emptiness in the middle of the hair here so there's still kind of a little bit of that head shape happening that's no good there um but we're not kind of ruining the original drawing that we created sometimes I catch myself not breathing while I'm doing this, kind of like holding my breath while I'm inking up. <laughs> Something that definitely can happen as well. Um, not great. It's good to breathe. Kind of important for us as a species. And so we got the jacket, we got the neck, got the collar on the other side. Um, again, at this stage, like, this in my brain would be final, but there is still a possibility that I will kind of come in and do some changes. Maybe I'll change my mind and think that like the, the you know, the kind of the monk kind of bead necklace might be a better idea. We'll see if I kind of like can fit that in. Um, but yeah. Ben Elbin. Okay, I'll have to watch that stream. I love Ben's work, actually. It's quite it's, um, very um, expressive, I think, something that I try and get a little bit more when I'm doing this. So, again, we're talking about, like, illustration. We're talking about how you would work in illustration uh, and, you know, tr constantly trying to, like, learn new stuff and, and apply it to different kind of settings. Uh, and what that means is, like, obviously watching streams like this or, or kind of watching other artists or speaking to other artists and seeing how they do what it is that they're doing. Um, but also trying to figure out different ways of inking. So in the past, like, I would, you know, like, stuff like this, for instance, where this line isn't quite connecting to the other one, that would be, like, a big no-no for me. And I would go and... I think now probably like over clean my drawings a little bit and they lose that kind of sense of like, hey, it's a drawing, it's done by hand. It, like it doesn't have to be so mechanical and perfect. And, and again, that, that's like, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that if you're into that, then you're doing the wrong thing. But it's just something that I was doing for a very long time and kind of thought like, there is a quality to my sketches that feel better 
than my finished line work. And I'm trying to figure out why that is and kind of coming to this conclusion that I think it's because I'm just like overlocking my lines. Like everything is just really super like locked in and tight uh, and there's no more room for this kind of sketchiness. So trying to like push myself to work in a slightly um, looser way and kind of in a way that's going to work a little bit more towards just like this is a drawing it's okay if there's things that kind of don't necessarily um connect and aren't like super clean um in that way um i'm also going to put in this staff now that he's got so i'm going to put this on a separate layer because what i'm going to do is i'm going to use my mouse at this stage and i'm going to draw a straight line so i'm just going to click once down here I'm using my mouse for this because if I don't, if I use my pen, um, I will get, uh, like, you'll see what happens. If I'm using my Wacom brush, I'm going to get a line that goes really quite thin to thick, which can be really cool if I'm looking for that kind of effect. But in this case, I'm really looking for, for something a little bit different. So I just want that solid kind of thick straight line throughout and making sure that that works for me. Um, and then, you know, I can try and get in a little bit of perspective in here and like do the second line and see how that looks. Like, do I have that stuff in a lot of perspective? Like, is it really coming out at us like this? Does that look weird? Um, if I'm having, you know, something like this, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Like, uh, I don't mind it, but again, like, I think I'd rather just have those two lines be nice and kind of clean and parallel. Um, so I can just kind of eyeball it and do this. Or if you really, really kind of you want to make sure that those two lines are nice and clean, we can just make a selection around this guy and using Alt and the Move tool, we can copy that and just drag another one down and we know that it's going to be um, nice and parallel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so there, we got our staff looking nice and parallel and clean, and then we do our ellipses. Um, ellipses always one of the biggest challenges for a lot of artists. Um, it's one of the big warm-ups that a lot of artists will also do is just like draw a bunch of ellipses a bunch of times just to kind of like loosen up the hand and, and kind of warm up. Um, but yeah, it's you know something that can always be tricky. So don't get too annoyed if you're kind of struggling with them a little bit. Um, and then again, the reason I put this on a separate layer is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to put a layer mask on it and paint that out from where it's being hidden. And that's going to mean that later on, if I decide to move that stuff, I can just move it around without having to worry about redrawing it, um, which is going to be super handy um, later on. So I'm going to unlock that layer mask to the actual staff layer. And you'll see that now if I move it around, wherever I put it, it's going to be kind of blocked to where I said it should go. So it's just a nice, um, nice way to work with the, the digital kind of output where you've got different layers. So, you know, use them, use them to best effect. Um, Lynn is asking me, um, do I always use black for inking, never color? Um, it depends. Being kind of like a, a more um, manga kind of inspired artist means that black is probably going to be the go always for me um, when it comes to inking. But that said, if I was doing like a painting, for instance, I could start thinking about color. So um, in our final stream, we're going to look at color. Uh, but long story short, like, for instance, if I was going to really make sure that this was going to be like all kind of skin colored, um, like the hands here, I could potentially work with what I know is going to be my skin color and then a darker version of that and that's going to give me a much more kind of like painterly feel to my drawing but 
Uh, I like a little bit more kind of like graphic value in here. So yeah, I will tend to use um, black a little bit more than any other color when I am inking like this. Um, reference on the hand holding a staff. So this is where sometimes I'll kind of look and kind of do this and like, you know, take photos or look in a mirror. You'll see probably like animators kind of do this thing as well, um, where they kind of, they're basically just kind of using reference um, to, to make sure that they're working in the right way um, and getting those poses correct. And that is looking pretty good. Um, get the rest of the jacket sleeve in here, get some kind of folds, hints of that happening, big kind of puffy cyberpunk jacket happening and then it goes into the sleeve so here i've done what we were kind of talking about last week we we're talking about foreshortening um and it is this so you can see those kind of lines in here these guys uh, are doing this kind of thing of like a cylinder in perspective coming out at us and then a second one coming out of that and getting really kind of in perspective so Effectively, it's just a really easy way for us to understand how that arm is going to come out at us and how that's going to work. So it just means like we're really like shortening that arm down and obviously the hand needs to be huge because it's a lot closer to us and we're kind of doing this lens um, effect. But yeah. So this is now detail in a jacket. Um, so this is not really outline, this is just like stitching a little bit. So I would use a thinner outline here. Um, again, because it's not really kind of sh creating shape, it's just a bit of detail in my line work. So I don't need it to be um, the same kind of level of thickness as everything else. And, and nor should it be because then it really takes on a little bit too much of a life of its own and I want it to kind of sit in the background a little bit more. Um, and I should probably look at sleeve reference here as well. I'm kind of doing this as if I knew what I was doing and it's not turning out the best. Um, so if I was kind of doing this properly, I would definitely at this stage, just look at references of kind of how sleeves work. I might even put on this similar kind of jacket and take photos like this and kind of see how that all reacts. Um, but yeah, again, we're doing this for a stream. We're doing this kind of a little bit um, short and sweet, but ideally I'd probably want to be a little bit more diligent with my referencing and getting that to look the way it should. Get some little bits of detail in here. Uh, and now the hand. So again, hand here is whoop, not this one. We're looking at this one. So you can see what I've done is I've done what we were kind of talking about last week, where I've done palm. And I've done fingers, one, two, three, four, and then kind of wedge sticking out for a thumb. All right, that's probably not long enough. There we go. Um, and then it's just a matter of bringing a little more back in, right? Kind of like bending these things to work to something that I'm kind of doing a little bit more accurately, right? Uh, and then that's kind of applying to our drawing. So again, hands, <clears throat> really one of the things that a lot of artists struggle with. Um, no matter how accomplished you are, I think probably hands are always gonna be kind of your kryptonite and something that you're gonna need to, to be aware of and probably work on the most. Um, it's definitely the case I know for me. Uh, 
Uh, and maybe we give him kind of monkey fingers. So let's see if we can get a little bit more like a sense of like fur maybe in the fingers or if that just looks a little bit silly no it just looks weird um so we're going to stay with our original idea and obviously this is a little bit stylized i will i do like the claws in there so i will leave those in and he's got that kind of glove on him as well and then the palm comes in like so so again another little tip for you <clears throat> if you're kind of struggling with um you know we looked at hands we looked at kind of how that potentially would work for you but fingers is again potentially going to be another issue um, and so how fingers work is we got palm and then we've got the hand generally roughly the same distance here so these two are going to be the same and then we've got one two three and then they break down into one two three as well not necessarily always on the same level because your fingers have different lengths um, <clears throat> but one of the things that can be really helpful is to think of these three sections so if we take any one of these kind of fingers um, we can start to think about how they would work in perspective right so we're going to join them up one two three progressively getting a little bit smaller and smaller as they go so this is basically going to be kind of like a finger Kind of almost a little bit kind of curled like this and then we do this and it just gives us immediately something a little bit kind of easier to work with than trying to figure out how this kind of round cylinder thing without really having any sides how does it work and where would a fingernail go and, and so on so doing this just means you have your sections a little bit more cleanly um, you can kind of see me kind of doing that in here. Like if I swap to a different color, you'll see what I mean. Um, you can almost see me doing that here, kind of in my brain and chopping those fingers up into distinct kind of segments to help myself kind of draw these into there. Um, so. You know the, the more you do this the better you'll get at it and the more you can kind of just skip straight to the chase and just do it from memory um this is by no means perfect um there's probably still a lot kind of wrong in a sort of technical anatomy sense with this like i'm sure that my drawing teachers from college would look at this and be like what are you doing um but who cares because they're not here and this is a drawing that i'm doing for myself and the simple fact is as well i think probably unless it's like glaring like this thumb here is really like he's really very quite thick um unless it's glaringly obvious probably most people won't really notice or even potentially not care um so you know careful with that thought obviously because it is something that's like well it might breed a little sense kind of like a laziness maybe um but definitely something that can potentially get in the way of you finishing a drawing or like progressing with a drawing so you know don't feel too too bad if you're really struggling with something and it looks wrong and therefore you're not going to show it ever to anybody out there because you kind of scared that people might call you out for making that mistake um probably most people won't notice and all care so work freely
Um, this is just me kind of now getting some, you know, elements of kind of cyberpunky looking things and that kind of like uniform, taking reference back from this stuff and looking at like the buckles and the sash around him and all this kind of stuff that is quite cool and that potentially I will want to have in my um, drawing. So lots of badges, cyberpunk, always, always ton of like flair and badges attached to everything. And then the pants. So again, folds, maybe something that, you know, will require a little bit of reference. Um, there's a ton of reference always out there on how to draw folds appropriately, how things work when they are folded and, you know, where, where do they kind of, where do those lines go, how you should do that. Um, I'm winging it. I've done a little bit of this before, but I'm, I don't think I'm super good at folds. It's definitely something if I was, again, spending a bit more time with this, i.e. not on a stream, I would probably go in and have a look and see kind of like, all right, how, how does that kind of fold? Um, you know, if there's a, if there's a leg inside there, how does it look when the kind of the pants wrap around it and so on and so forth. Other advantage of me kind of relinquishing this hang up on doing really clean and perfect lines is I can work a little bit faster and I get stuff done a little bit more quickly, a little bit more loosely, um, which means I can have a little bit more fun with things and um, also potentially clients are happier because they're getting their work sooner. Win win. Um, you see me jumping around, I started working on that other foot and now I'm moving to this one. Um, again, no biggie here, just as long as it all gets done, eventually we're happy. Shoes and feet is another thing that I really struggle with a lot. Um, but yeah, again, practice, practice, practice. Um, so would you approach, got a question here. Would you approach the line work of this piece differently if you knew it was going to be digital only versus printed products? Um, I probably wouldn't too much. Um, you mentioned a kind of a Gaussian blur, um, to make it pop is something that can be really cool, that effect. Um, and I'll show you guys that in just a sec when we're kind of wrapped with getting this line work in. Um, and what that will do is kind of give it that celluloid feel a little bit. It's quite, it's quite a, a cool thing. I think it really just depends on what you are intending with a particular piece, really, at the end of the day. There's no kind of like, I don't think there would be a huge difference in terms of like, are oh, you doing this for print? Therefore your line work needs to look like this. Um, that's just me though. Um, different people again would work in different ways. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's an interesting question because it would potentially, if, again, if it was a client thinking of like, we need to do animation for instance on this, then I would potentially structure my layers differently as in um, I'd put the arm on a different layer, I'd put the head on a different layer, so on and so forth, um, <clears throat> just so that they can then kind of like puppeteer it all and, and get a sense of um, animation or motion happening on this. The tail in here, and maybe give him a little Band-Aid on his tail because, you know, he's a fighter. He's seen some action and this is potentially where we can have a little bit of that kind of fur hint 
seen that. Here we go. And then finish this up. Oops. This is untied. It's very, very dangerous of him. And yeah, I think that's it. So <clears throat> let's hide these uh, and let's go into a quick little, a few little tips before we wrap up. So um, Johanna was asking about potentially kind of like a Gaussian blur. So how that would work is like so. So let me hide this sketch now that we're. Um, kind of happy with how all this looks um, and kind of you know the overall kind of structure and the inking here and um, what I would do is I would create a new copy of this layer so command J it's going to duplicate that layer um, and then on the bottom layer I would go to um, filter blur and then Gaussian blur and then increase that that's too much just a little bit of a blur effect on this um, and then drop the opacity of that layer down a little bit and you get this kind of slightly like it's almost like printed on glass or plastic it gives it a really strong kind of celluloid effect so that could be cool to work with um it, it can be maybe a little bit counterintuitive but definitely an effect that we can work with um something else that we can kind of think about doing at this stage uh, and we'll talk a little bit about shading uh, at a different stage but is to get that kind of anime look uh, and again we're, we'll cover this next week <clears throat> sorry in a couple of weeks but here's a, a little tip for you guys that I'll leave you on in terms of getting what's called a, a half tone um, and that is a very kind of like anime um, used in pop art because it's so inexpensive it's a really easy way to get a half tone and that's why it's called half tone or screen tone without using another color so the reason it's inexpensive is because you can still use black but you give the impression of a gray without having to use a gray so if you're printing with screen print or different colors you get to save on an extra color um, but still have that same effect so it's, it's definitely something that was used originally because of what it allowed people to do and then kind of save money on stuff and now is kind of synonymous with a particular style uh, and very synonymous with comic books and, and, and manga. So here we go. I'm going to do a very quick um, rough kind of sense of let's say that the light is going to come from over here. Right? Uh, and so I'm going to do very, very quickly. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we're almost out of time. And I just want to show you guys this very, very quickly before we wrap. And I won't do all of it either. All right, I'm going to fill this with black. Looks absolutely ridiculous right now. Um, then I am actually going to give this a kind of like a 50% gray. So I'm going to boost that up to roughly about 50 here. There we go. And I'm going to drag this behind my line work and I'm going to go to filter pixelate and then color half tone and it's going to bring up this window and i want all my channels to be at a 45 degree angle so channels is basically going to work with cmyk in this sense um, but i want all of those to overlap if i don't do that let me show you quickly what happens you'll get um if you like walk 
very closely up to like a giant billboard printed poster you'll see these kind of dots you've probably seen this kind of stuff before so you get your four channels here cyan magenta yellow and black um i want all of those to be overlapping to only have black dots so here we go we're gonna go back into pixelate color halftone and then we're going to set all of these to 45 degrees angles and voila we've got black dots overlapping yeah. um, then i can set this at this stage i can set this to multiply so that it won't kind of show anything and then i can put a layer mask on here and start to kind of paint some of this stuff out if i mess up i can paint it back in um, you could do this with a um, half tone brush and we'll look at that when we talk about shading but it's just a really quick and easy way to show um a little bit of kind of manga style kind of shading without having to kind of do all the work in there so again go into um, filter pixelate and it leaves just here and color half tone um and that's about it that's where we'll kind of leave it off um, for today, let me save all of that, kind of important. Um, next week, we're going to look at coloring this in, so getting a sense of color, um, getting a little bit of lighting, and then the week after that, we'll look at shading, um, getting some kind of special effects in there, and we'll also look at kind of how to turn this into something a little bit more graphic, like add some graphic elements to it, some type, maybe some shapes in the background, so that it goes from just being a, an illustration on its own to something that we can use as kind of like a, a whole thing if you will it's got a little bit more kind of context and application um so that's it um hope you guys enjoyed it thanks for tuning in thanks for the questions everybody and uh, and we will hopefully see you next week for a coloring one thanks for watching and take care